So we move across now, keeping with our theme, our VR theme, and, and really looking at the potential of VR and AR in the future. Next gentleman on stage is actually somebody who, who um, actually advises the American government, not just the American government in terms of VR, but many other governments throughout the world here in Germany, in Europe, and as I say, ar countries around the world world indeed in terms of what they should be doing with their VR strategies. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for the head of public policy of Oculus from Facebook, Mr. James Hairston. Thank you. Oh, the clicker. Do you have the... Yeah, oh, just, okay. uh, All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's a real honor to be here uh, at CBIT on behalf of Oculus and Facebook uh, and really be a part of all the energy around virtual reality and augmented reality here in Europe. So I was actually going to start uh, by talking about some research uh, that we've done around uh, the potential for virtual reality in Europe and the great excitement and energy uh, and then some of the program work that we're doing. But actually, I wanted to begin with some of the great work that's actually going on here at CBIT. So over in Hall 17, you can go check out virtual reality and augmented reality startups from all across the region, representing all the different member states, speaking all different languages, and solving all the big challenges in virtual and augmented reality. And more so than any sort of statistics or numbers that I can share, they really represent all of the awesome work that's going on in solving the big technical and related challenges in virtual and augmented reality. So really go and check out these startups. I mean, they're doing fantastic, fantastic work. And, and I think they really speak to the potential and the excitement around virtual reality and all the great breakthroughs that are going to happen here in Europe and around the world. So moving on to, to sort of why it is we think virtual reality is going to have such a big impact and, and the things that it's going to change about what we do every day. What I'd like to focus on is the fact that VR is going to be a place where we can do all of the everyday computing that we do right now. People often ask, you know, what field is, is VR going to impact? What is it going to change? You know, is it going to be education? Or is it going to be health training? Or industrial design and development? Or art? Or music? And the real answer is it's all of those things. I mean, anything that we can do in two dimensions, that we can do on our phones or our computers, we're going to be able to do in immersive environments. That includes computer programming, data management, and spreadsheet design. Uh, again, listening to music, exercising, teleconferencing, working on remote projects. Everything that we can do in two dimensions, we will be able to do in 3D. And the work of the great startups that you see here and companies all around the world are going to continue to push breakthroughs that allow us to compute and do everything that we do in our everyday lives on 2D screens in three dimensions. So now I'd like to talk about sort of the characteristics of virtual reality that make it really exciting and, and will get us to that place and, and really explain why at Oculus we're really bullish on the technology and why we really are focused on giving people the power to do anything, anywhere, with anyone. And so we'll start with a look at the economy and jobs and sort of research into what the potential for this technology is across sectors and why it's going to change and impact all of the sectors that we uh, you know, work in and are exploring and doing research in all around the world. Second is education. And I think when people think about the potential for virtual reality and the sectors that it can really change, education comes to mind as a place where we can lower barriers to entry and really give people world-class access to training uh, and resources in their libraries and their museums. And we'll see and talk a little bit more about that in a second as well. And then finally is empathy. You know, virtual reality is the first technology that really allows us to take someone else's perspective on fully. And we've seen great work by documentary filmmakers using 360 video and virtual reality developers and content creators that really allow us to take a look and step into someone else's shoes. And again, we'll talk about why empathy and, and the ability to really put, some, put people into someone else's shoes is an important characteristic of what virtual reality allows us to do. So looking at the economy, uh, and as I mentioned, we have research coming out uh, in the coming months that looks at VR and AR activity across the European Union. 
and it finds that in 2015, there was about 708 million euros in sort of production value around virtual and augmented reality. Now, fast forwarding this activity and looking out to 2020, this could reach 15 to 36 billion dollars over the course uh, of the next five years. And again, this is in sectors far and wide, not just in sort of the pure technology sector or the industrial design and development sector or art or education. This is across the board. And this is in you know, the hard sciences and research and in development and film and content creation. There's a lot of opportunity here. So to put this in, in a bit of context, uh, we worked with a firm last year, Analysis Group, an economic consulting firm, to look at what the global economic impact of virtual and augmented reality could be uh, over the course of the next five years to 2020. And so that study found that you know, VR and AR could add up to $126 billion to the global economy. And again, this is across sectors and in different areas. Uh, all of the different ways that we work and collaborate, that we design and build virtual and augmented reality into the things that we're doing every day. So coming back and looking at what's already happened uh, across the EU. Uh, what's the work that, that's been going on? And, you know, there have been world-class institutions here in the EU that have been researching VR and AR going back to the early 90s. And the funding from the EU, uh, from the European Union, and from member states that's gone uh, into VR and AR is summarized here, where there have been over 450 projects to the tune of over a billion dollars invested in VR and AR. And again, pushing the science and the research uh, around VR and AR and helping lead to breakthroughs, sometimes great companies, uh, from these research funds. And so we'll look to see what happens over the course of the next five years, but this work is really important to sort of driving the breakthroughs and the developments that, that help many of the, the companies and universities working in VR across the region uh, really f power forward with the technology. And just looking at some case studies, I mean, not everything is connected to these research funds. There are also companies that are exploring the sort of frontiers of VR and AR, uh, as well as museums and cultural institutions. So you've got Automakers like Audi and the Jaguar Group who use VR and AR uh, in their design and development. Um, in terms of art, there was a Europeana project last year in 2016 to celebrate the Dutch presidency of the, of the EU that uh, took people on stationary bicycles and put them in VR and let them explore uh, virtual and augmented reality displays and art from all across the region. So we really see VR and AR uh, being used in all of the, the different sectors of our economies. And actually here in Germany, in the museum system, um, the Natural History Museum uh, in Berlin has even used virtual reality to supplement its work. So we see VR and AR everywhere. And, and again, there's vast potential for the technology here across the region. So now going back to sort of that second E that I was talking about, first was economy, uh, turning to education. And, and why we think there's so much potential for VR and AR to change the way that we learn. What you see up here on your screen is the new Mission ISS experience, which just launched in the Oculus Store, and is a partnership with the European Space Agency, NASA, and the Canadian Space Agency. And this allows you to basically get into the, European, into the uh, International Space Station and test out and, and work and train as if you were an astronaut. And astronauts here on the ground have actually done uh, their training using, uh, using uh, the, the Mission ISS program. And now it's available for students or enthusiasts all around the world to be able to train as an astronaut would train. And I think this is really representative of sort of what we can begin to do in virtual and augmented reality. Lowering the barriers uh, for people to, to access world-class training anywhere, in their homes, in their schools, at museums, in libraries. And we really, really can do so much there. So now turning back to that final E, which was empathy, uh, and thinking about the ways that this technology and, and being able to shift our perspective allows us to take on the viewpoint of someone else and really understand the world through someone else's shoes. And we, again, we've seen documentary filmmakers and others really take advantage of virtual reality uh, to drive our understanding. This is a look at one of my favorite experiences in virtual reality. It's called Notes on Blindness. And it allows you to step into the shoes of a man who lost his sight in 1983. And on the Gear VR, you can jump in and listen to his audio tapes as he describes the world as he lost his sight and the importance of sound and being able to navigate the world and, and slowly losing, you know, again, the, the, 
perception that he'd relied on. And this really, I think, showcases what it is that VR can do in putting us in someone else's shoes. This quote I like to think about a lot as we have conversations around the world right now about our ability to understand and relate to each other or experience things like outer space that we, uh, that we don't understand. But VR is really a powerful tool for helping us jump into someone else's shoes, see the world from each other's perspectives, communicate with each other, and, and maybe understand the world through someone else's eyes. The United Nations had a, a really powerful documentary, Clouds Over Sidra, that allowed uh, anyone who was using it to step into life in a refugee camp. And again, the potential for empathy in virtual reality is, is another reason why we really believe this technology is going to be central to the way we express ourselves, the way we communicate, and the way we learn about the world around us. So what are we doing at Oculus and, and, and at Facebook? And, and, and what's, what's our role in the ecosystem? This is actually a look at our VR for Good page. You can go to oculus.com slash VR for Good and look at some of the programs that we've begun rolling out around the world. Up here on your screen are two, uh, the VR for Good Creators Lab, which pairs documentary filmmakers with nonprofits to really build immersive films about causes that, that people really care about. And then here on the other side, our High School 360 Filmmakers Challenge, which gives high school students 360 cameras and asks them to really begin to create films that explain the world as they see it and what they're learning. And so not only are they learning uh, to, to sort of begin to build immersive film, but they're getting the skills to, to operate and, and begin to design in all of these new technologies. So we'll actually close with a, a bit more about health work. And in the next keynote, you're going to learn a lot more uh, about some of the partnerships that, that we're doing at Oculus around the world. But, but health is a space that we really think VR and health training is a space that VR is really going to impact. So I want to talk quickly about two programs uh, that we're bringing to Germany and to the European Union over the course of the year and beyond, just like those education programs you saw uh, in the previous slide. Uh, so over the last year, we've partnered with uh, the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles and Stanford's Children's Hospital, which is presenting next, uh, to help design modules that help doctors and students learn more about the human body or about uh, how to deliver difficult procedures. Again, work that can really supplement uh, the training and the learning that's going on by bringing virtual reality to medical challenges. And so we're really excited about these programs and about the potential to bring them to medical institutions and schools and libraries and museums all around the world. And again, you're about to see some awesome stuff, so when, when the Stanford team comes up, you'll really get a chance to, to understand the great work that, that they've done as our partners. So I'll just close you know, by again saying, at Oculus, our role in this ecosystem is to deliver world-class hardware and software to allow all of this activity to happen. And whether it's the startups who are doing amazing work over in Hall 17, or great medical institutions, or educational uh, institutions around the world, or space agencies, uh, we're really focused on being a part of that ecosystem. And where we can, designing and supporting great programs that showcase the value of virtual reality now and well into the future. Thank you so much for your time. And we're really, really excited to have been part of CBIT. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen. Hands together for James Heston.